All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday Mortgage Coach Call. Uh, I'm Dave Savage, CEO of Mortgage Coach. To help me interview Nicole Solari today, I am fortunate to have my good friend and industry legend, Cindy Ertman. What's up, Cindy? Hey, Dave. It's great to see you. Good, good to see you. So, so by the way, folks, I interviewed Cindy. I don't know. It's been a little over a month. I think we did two interviews. And... <laughs> And, and they were how Cindy goes about um, meeting with realtors and building relationships with agents and, de and just delivering amazing value. So uh, highly recommend you check those out. I'll put links down below. They were just a, you know, literally a couple months ago. So they're super on point. It's 2018. It's the end of July. And we've got Nicole Solari back. What's up, Nicole? Hello. Good morning. Hey, or afternoon for you East Coast folks. Yeah, and then for anybody who's just watching this uh, on our YouTube channel, hello. So, so Nicole, I, I positioned this call around, you know, the ultimate open house experience. And I did that because when I posted questions in our Facebook group, they all came back, you know, open house, open house. I mean, there were a few like, how can a lender get a meeting with you? Um, those types of questions, but they were all open house. Um, I don't know where the conversation is going to go. I do know we've got a lot of open house questions. Um, but I, I know when I've introduced you in the past, it's always been, hey, Nicole, four years in the business. She did a, what was 198 loans last year? Or not loans, but homes? Home, 197, that, yeah. What, 197. 20. I'll correct that on Facebook. And, and historically, in these four years that you've been in the business, your number one lead source has been open houses, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So, I mean, that's quite a story. I mean, she was on Inman's stage last year and sharing her strategies. I've interviewed her, you know, this I think will be the fifth interview. So if you want to listen to some of those just playbooks on how to get people to come to an open house, how to optimize leads, how to drive business, down below, I'll put what I think are two of the most on-point interviews that I've done. Um, but Nicole, give us an update on where, where your practice is at, you know, coming into the, the end of July of 2018. So crazy, halfway through the year, um, we're currently at 128 units and 54 million in sales. So a really strong first start. We're looking forward to helping more families at the end of this year. Um, historically, October and December have always been my biggest months. So I'm really excited to see what the second half of the year brings um, for me and the team. Uh, as you know, I've uh, left a big brand last year to open my own brokerage, so it's been a little bit of a whirlwind getting that set up um, in the first few first first quarter of this year. Um, now we're we're doing really really well. We've got a couple um, agents not on my team, but just agents in the brokerage that are also doing really well, and we've we're continuing to build our brand in the marketplace. And we actually just opened a second location, so we've got two offices now, and also a second property management company. So for anyone who hasn't heard you before, if you could just tell your markets a little bit about the markets that you serve. Yeah, so I started in Solano County, which is on the I-80 corridor between San Francisco and Sacramento. And um, it services three cities, Vacaville, Vallejo, and uh, Fairfield. Vallejo being the number one housing market in America. Um, actually, I think it fell to number two or three last month, but still kind of a bananas market. And then we just opened our secondary location in Napa. And I think that everybody out there knows where Napa is. Right on, right on. Well, uh, you were originally referred to me by Jeremy Forcier. You know, when I wanted to start interviewing more realtors, I put the word out to some of my, you know, the most prolific loan officers in the mortgage coach community, and he introduced me to you, and you, you were incredible. I mean, you were one of the top interviews in 2017. And, and, and when I asked Jeremy, hey, what's a, how should we position this call? He's like, Nicole is a force of nature. So I think that's a pretty cool topic. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, what I'd like to do, because Cindy's not going to be able to be on the whole call, I'd love to throw it to her and have her ask the first few questions. Also, I want to remind folks that are on this call, this is live streaming in our Facebook group, Mortgage Coach Productivity Mastermind. If you are um, listening to the recording and you're not part of that group and you're a loan officer and you're not going to spam or put in noise, Opt in, we'll let you in, and we'd love to have you ask questions and collaborate. Um, and, and if you're watching this on YouTube and you get value, give us a like and share this with your other mortgage friends. 
And, and by the way, Nicole, while you're talking to loan officers, a lot of loan officers will use this to better partner with their agents. So kind of be intentional around the, we're doing a call to help loan officers add more value to agents and help agents and loan officers work better together. Is that cool? Got it. Cindy, first questions. Well, first of all, Nicole, I was really intrigued when I started doing some research around you and when Dave reached out to me about what questions I might have for you, because candidly, my whole mortgage practice has been made up of realtor referrals for the last 30 years and being a top producer within the country for so many years. I was really intrigued by you having the ability to get so many leads through open houses. So the first question I would have is walk us through your process of obviously there's a setup factor to you getting people to actually come to the open house. And there's got to be some really unique processes that you do as a matter of practice when people actually show up to the front door. So kind of start us from the beginning, if you would, and walk us through kind of how you get people there, how you market the property, and then a little bit about your process when you're physically actually holding the open house. If you don't mind, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. So um, when I first started in the business, I was doing five, six, seven, eight open houses a week. So I had strategies around the different types of open houses that I was doing. Um, you've got your standard open houses, which is your Saturday, Sunday, 11 to 2, 1 to 4. Um, those, I think everybody knows how to do. Some of the more fun open houses that I did were things like Wacky Wednesday. So here in our market during the school year, kids get out of school early release on Wednesdays. So it's a great opportunity to capture people, nannies, parents picking their kids up, especially if you have a listing that you can hold open right around the corner from a local school. Put your open house signs right there as they're leaving the pickup, you'll get a ton of traffic because the last thing anybody wants to do when they're picking up three kids from school is go straight home. So if nothing else, you're going to have some company. Um, and it just drives a ton of traffic. The other thing that we were doing is I, used, I always call Thursday the new Friday. Uh, so Thursdays we would do twilight open houses. We would have um, directionals coming in, stop by for appetizers. We'd have appetizers and um, champagne that we would serve, especially in the luxury markets where people would be coming home from work ready for Friday, but not quite ready for the weekend, but it's kind of like a primer to the weekend. So just fun stuff, things that make people go, huh, this is a little bit different and they remember you instead of just them walking into your open house on a Saturday, um, spending their Saturday looking at houses and getting a flyer and, you know, not remembering you from the next five or six realtors that they meet at the same feeling open houses. Hey, Nicole, before we jump, go from there, I want to remind folks, because one of the things that made Nicole so interesting is she had moved to this market and it was a new market. She didn't grow up there. She didn't live there. She reinvented herself. And not only did she do all the open houses she just listed or all the concepts she just did, she just used open houses to work. You know, any place where she could connect and build her database, create friends, and hopefully some of those friends were people that were buying homes now, she worked. So, Nicole, I just wanted to clear that up because there's so many new loan officers, new realtors coming into the space. And it's, you know, one of my takeaways is this is one of those things, whether you've been doing it for a long time or you're new, you could just kill it with your strategy. So would you mind just describing that for like 30 seconds on how you used to do that? Yeah, so I actually moved up from Silicon Valley when I first started in the industry. I was pregnant at the time. Um, I got licensed, or I had my, I got licensed in March, literally took my uh, DRE test on my due date, licensed in March, had my baby in April, and then started with a big brand in um, March and, or sorry, April, May, June, actually June, Friday the 13th, June 13th, um, I started with a big brand and from June to December, uh, closed my closed 38 transactions, which for a rookie in a market where you go in literally not knowing a single soul, actually, I didn't even know how to pronounce half the cities I worked in. Um, literally, I was calling them the wrong things during open houses until a couple of times people corrected me. <laughs> and I, um, I, I just built my sphere of influence through those open houses. And like Dave said, I did it to work because I think a lot of realtors, um, and this is great for, for lenders to know too, I think a lot of lender or realtors you know, they sign up with a brand and then they get, they get an office, they get their BRE license or DRE license, and then they expect the business to start by just showing up to the office. Well, unlike traditional jobs, you don't just show up to the office and clock in and clock out. You've actually got to go find the business. So I went out to the market and actually found the business. Love, love that. And then folks, remember, I've got other interviews where she goes through this in details, but I, 
this is a great start to this call, Sydney. So you keep it going. I just want to make sure I, I pulled out some of that gold from past interviews. Well, obviously you've been able to capture, you know, tremendous amounts of leads. So can you walk us through our process of what happens when someone enters a house and just what kind of conversation, how you're actually collecting their information and their data. And then I've got some other questions that I'll follow with regarding how you track that. For sure. So I'm big on how people feel and how you make people feel. Um, that, you know, there's a saying, people will remember what you say or what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And so when I knew that I was going to go into the real estate world, because real estate's my, my second career after um, many years in Silicon Valley, but I would go in pregnant while I was practicing, while I was studying for my license and I would go into open houses and see how other real estate agents made me feel in my market. And I wouldn't, I would just, I wouldn't lie, but I would just say, Hey, yeah, I'm interested in this house. This is what I'm looking for. And we had just bought our house. So I was open. I was like, we just bought our house. Here's our experience with our realtor up here and to see how people interacted with me. And so I didn't necessarily get a lot of nuggets on what to do, but I definitely knew what not to do. And so I took those and I realized that people don't want to feel pressure. They don't want to feel like they're being forced to sign in. They don't want to feel like they're being sold to. They want information. They want valuable information that no one else can provide them. For example, what are the local elementary schools? What are the local middle schools? You would be so surprised to know how many realtors sit at an open house and they don't even know what school district they're sitting in. They don't know if there's Melarus. They don't know if there's taxes. They don't know, you know, if you are one county over, which we're, I service two counties, that the loan limits are completely different by close to over $100,000. So those little things that people would come in and we would just have conversations around differentiated me instead of me just saying, sign in, sign in, sign in, sign in. What are you looking for? How many beds? How many baths? Do you have kids? Is school, are schools important? It was just conversations and it made people feel really comfortable and they would end up calling me. So you're totally focused on them, which is so much as Dave knows in interviewing me so much my approach when I'm actually trying to build new referral partners, same thing, it's all about them. So first of all, that's huge. The fact that you went into open houses to identify how people made you feel, so you were so aware of that, you probably learned a lot more what not to do, like you said, than what to do. That's really cool. I absolutely love that approach. That's really a beautiful thing. So obviously at some point during the open house, you are you know, gaining information from them. How do you go about it when you're ready to actually ask the question of do they want to sign in or give you their name and email and all that? Yeah, so I take two approaches, you know, depending on how I've, how I've built rapport with them. Um, I say something along the lines of, hey, for safety reasons, um, the sellers asked for you to sign in just so we know who's coming in and out of the house. Or I'll use the approach of, hey, just so you know, this is a brand new listing and the seller is really excited to sell this home. I need them to know that I'm doing my job. If you could just put your contact information down so that they can see that you actually came through and they know that I'm, I'm working really hard to sell their house for them. And then I, I usually segue right into something right after that. So they don't even give me the opportunity to object. It's, hey, please sign in. Oh, and by the way, did you see the XYZ? So as they're going to move in, instead of giving me an objection, I go right into a conversation. I love that. That's actually, it's brilliant. And you're creating massive value in the process. So once you actually get contact information, because that's the other thing, and I hear realtors say to me all the time, I'm horrible at following up on leads from open houses. And most people, and I find actually to some degree, lenders tend to be better at tracking things than I found some of the realtor partners that I've worked with over the years. So Tell us about like once you once you leave that open house, what kind of tracking system do you use and how do you stay in touch with them after that? Because you've obviously converted so many of these people into buyers because you don't even have time right now to do open houses because you have so many leads from your open houses, which is a pretty great problem to have, I'd say. <laughs> it really is. Uh, lucky, I guess. Um, so I'll take it back to when I first started because now I have a pretty fancy CRM that has drip systems and automated follow-ups, but I didn't always have that. So um, taking it back four years ago, I would have everyone sign in. And then the second that my open house was done, you know, I know everybody's really, really anxious after a three, four hour open house to get out of there, grab their signs and go grab a cocktail or a burrito or whatever. But I would sit at the open house and I would go through my open house list and I would take notes. Blue shirt, had three kids, need somewhere for their dogs. And then I would send them a personalized email. Even if it was 30 people that came through my open house, I would wow. sit there at the open house and send 30 personalized emails to say, Hey, Joe, it was really nice to meet you and your wife, Sue. I'm, 
I understand that you've got, you know, four large Huskies, backyard's important. Obviously this backyard here wasn't a fit for you, but here's three more listings in the neighborhood that you described that you wanna live where I think it could work for you. Let me know if you wanna go out tomorrow and see these. And I would also text them, hey, I just sent you an email, let me know if you got it. So just being in their face right after because there's lack of follow-up. So even if I was at one of those traditional Friday or Saturday, Sunday open houses and they went to eight different homes and met eight different realtors and they signed in at eight different places, I guarantee you I'm the only one that's going to be sending them an email that same day. A hundred percent. I can guarantee that too. I mean, that's a differentiator right out of the gate. That's absolutely huge. So I mean, you obviously have a great system. That personalized approach to follow up is so huge because I'm sure that differentiated you right out of the gate. And you began to build a relationship because if you, if I was the buyer walking through the house and you do that to me, first of all, I'd be really impressed just at your follow up and, you know, and just that you reached out in such a human and personal way. But how do you then integrate, obviously, um, getting people pre qualified and taking that next step? Talk to us a little bit about how you work with your lender in this process, too. So I'm usually having those conversations up front and it's again, more of a conversation and a casual conversation that I bring up than, you know, making it feel like, Hey, I don't want to work with you unless you're qualified. So at the open house, when they come in, I always say, Oh, and by the way, who's your lender? Like an assumption question. Like I'm assuming you already have a lender. Who's your lender? And right off the bat, they're going to say, you know, Susie or Steve or, Oh, I don't have one. Or we haven't even gotten to that point yet. So then without even asking the question, I get the answer that I want. And then I can take the next step from there. I can say, well, you know, I work with a great lender. Oh, by the way, he's available right now. If you want me to call him in real time and he can kind of tell you your affordability. I always use the line of, um, you don't know what you can afford by looking at a purchase price. You know what you can afford when you know what you can spend each month. And you don't know that until you talk to a professional. So that gets them thinking like, you're right, you know, how much would this house be a month? And I say, well, I don't know, I'm not the expert in that area. I'm the realtor, let me get my lender on the phone. There's just like a million and one ways to segue into it. I think the important thing is to not make them feel like you're pressuring them or not make them feel like you, they, they need to talk to a lender to be able to work with you. Right. Well, and how, I mean, I know one of the frustrations for mortgage originators is some of the realtor partners just don't feel comfortable at say, to your point, like pushing a borrower to talk to their lender. So if someone walks into you and says, look, I've already been pre-qualified with Wells Fargo or Bank of America, whoever the lender might be, um, do you leave it at that point or do you still try to encourage them to get pre-qualified with a lender that you have faith and trust in? Number two, any realtor that's not comfortable pushing their preferred lender, I just want to like shake them. Like, what's wrong <laughs> with you? This is going to be your deal. Do you want some lender that you don't know messing up your deal? <laughs> I just want to shake them because there should never be a reason that you're not comfortable having that conversation. If you truly believe in your lender partner that you have on your side and you know, you can push them and push them and they can still go with the lender that they came with, came pre-approved with, you know, whether it's an internet lender or a local bank or their credit union. And I'm not saying those guys do a bad job, but I always know that like, for example, Jeremy, I, I know how Jeremy works and Jeremy knows how I work. And that's so important, especially when we're dealing with lenders that don't know our, our micro, our micro environments, right? right? They don't know the way that uh, we fund here. They don't know that we only have one morning recording. They don't know that they have to fund two days before so that we can release the record the day before we actually record. Like those things, Jeremy just knows, right? I don't need to explain that to Steve from Missouri. I mean, I would love to, but sometimes Steve from Missouri doesn't want to listen. So I always encourage all the lend all the agents on my team to make sure that they at least have a conversation with one of our preferred lenders. And it's no obligation. It's just a conversation. Well, first of all, I love that. And that's huge. I mean, because you built a team relationship with your lender, which is huge, which is one of the things that's so powerful and the trust factor that's been developed between the two of you. But Talk to us, can you walk us through like how you would refer Jeremy when you're talking to a client that may have come in that's already pre-qualified with somebody? Um, so if they come in and they say, oh, well, I'm already pre-approved with, let's just say, uh, Bank of Napa. I say, 
Bank of Napa is great. I've worked with them a couple of times before. They do a wonderful job, but I'm going to tell you what, in this competitive market right now, as a listing agent, as well as a buyer's agent, when I see Bank of Napa and I don't know that loan officer, I'm going to think twice about accepting an offer and I'm going to encourage my seller to work with a local team. Would you be open to having a conversation with one of my local lenders so that you can actually have that pre-approval in your back pocket? Even if you don't end up using it at the end of the day, at least we know that we can use that as leverage to help make your offer stronger. That's huge. I love that. that thank you. That's actually really helpful for a lot of people. And I think it's hugely important for mortgage originators to actually teach their realtor partners how to refer them because a lot of them really don't know what to say. They get very uncomfortable. They don't want to be pushy. And that's, you know, you're providing value and actually making that suggestion. It's not a pushy way of encouraging your borrowers or your buyers to actually talk to your lender. Um, I love that. And I'm, I'm curious too, in terms of, so a lot of people obviously aren't ready to buy right away. What system are you using now that continues to track these people, stay in touch with these people if they're not ready to buy right now today? So I use a, um, I use a, com a conversion drip through Commissions Inc. So SYNC, C-I-N-C. It's um, our CRM platform that also has a drip system and they have stock drips, but I've actually done some uh, custom drips. So we can tag them with, you know, six months out and then they go on a six month trip. We can tag them with credit repair. So maybe I've referred them to my credit repair person and they're on a, you know, three, a 90 day credit repair. So they're getting the drips for me. So they feel like they're still in touch with me. I don't necessarily have to call the 20 people that are on credit repair, but when they're ready to buy, they're definitely going to come back to me. Um, so I would, I would say that if you're able and you're, you're at that point in your business to be able to get a CRM as robust as something like commissions, Inc., I would, I would invest in it because once you get so busy and you're getting a hundred plus leads a week and you can't keep it all up here, that CRM becomes the brain for you. That's awesome. And what's most important to you in your lender? It sounds basic, but it's really not. It's communication. And it's not just calling and saying, Hey, Nicole, what's up? Cause that's communication. It's more, Hey, Nicole. Oh my gosh. I'm going to say a, a bad word. Shit just hit the fan, <laughs> Shit hit the fan. And I got to tell you what the solution is. And, and, and if you can think of something better, let me know, but here's what's happening. Uh, they just went out and they bought a car. They bought a car yesterday. I told them 15 times, <laughs> don't buy a car. And they saw that minivan and they had to have it. Here's what we're going to do. Well, two things you just said there. One, and I, I lived by this personally is, you know, you deliver bad news faster than you deliver good news because you just need to keep the realtor partner in the loop and you always call with the solution. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the key. You know, before I'd make that call, I'd always have, you know, an alternative B and C plan, but I always went into every loan kind of having an A, B and C plan as well. So you just reiterated that that trust is developed so profoundly when you're, they're communicating, you know, negative information as well as positive information. This is amazing. And I love the fact that you're so willing to share what you've done and the fact that you built, you started a career in a market that you had absolutely no background, no friends, like no, I mean, you started from scratch and to show that you could actually do that through open houses is pretty profound. So this is really cool. I really appreciate you sharing. Yeah, of course. I love sharing. So Cindy, you certainly did not disappoint. I'm so glad I had you on this call. That was a great conversation you guys just had. Uh, I want to remind folks, if you want to jump in this conversation while I have a bunch more questions to ask, uh, it's not too late. You can either put them in the Zoom environment, or I do recommend um, it's posted at the pot, top of our Facebook group today, um, a place for you to submit questions. I've got about eight, maybe nine more questions for you, Nicole. Cindy, I know you've got to jump to a, another coaching session soon, but is there anything else you want to say before you uh, get to your next meeting? I just want mortgage originators to really pay attention to this because first of all, sharing this interview with their realtor partners, when I saw you were doing this interview, I already had emailed my mortgage partner saying, hey, as soon as this interview goes live, let's make sure we share this with our realtor partners because realtors are always looking for new ways just as we are to generate more business. And, and our role and our job is to really create value for our partners. So particularly for your agents that are newer to the business that are looking for ways to get started, it's a pretty big deal. So I would just encourage people to, it's one of the things I love about 
your platform, Dave, and um, going into this next call that I'm doing, which will have 35 loan originators on it, the first thing I'm going to do is talk to them about this call and how they have to join your community and share this call with their real estate community. And that's the beauty of, you know, sharing of information and helping each other be the best that we can be. And Nicole, I want to thank you for being so willing to share and allowing me to ask you some questions that were on my mind this morning. And as always, Dave, thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Take right care. On. Take, take care, Cindy. I really appreciate it. Bye. So one homework assignment for everybody. And then also a reminder, we have a lead conversion playbook that goes through all of the best practices of lead conversion. And the, the first two strategies, there's three principles, 12 strategies. The first two are how are you getting referred to by your agent? And does your agent know how you're unique and why you're valuable? So if you, if you haven't done that playbook, I recommend you check out strategy one and two. There'll be a link to it down below because Nicole crushed that. Um, also, when I interviewed Jeremy Forcier, it's probably one of the most viewed interviews I've done. And I asked him, you know, what are the questions you ask when you meet with realtors? It's funny, Nicole, you said, hey, my number one thing is communication. And Jeremy said, you know, hey, here's, here's my interview. And they always say the number one thing is communication. And then he has, and let me walk you through how I communicate and obviously part of that is how he integrates the total cost analysis into his conversation. But if you haven't listened to that interview, five questions Jeremy asks every realtor, and then what he says when realtors say, hey, communication is my number one thing. So Nicole, before I start ripping off more questions here, anything you wanna say, knowing that there's gonna be a lot of mortgage coach loan officers on here and realtors, any, any thoughts before I keep it rolling here? Um, you know, I've been doing this for four years now and I do a lot of these interviews, not just with Dave and I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. And I just want to tell everybody out there, like, stop overthinking it. Just get out there and do it. Like, it's not that hard. Actually, I take it back. It's something actually Jeremy says. It's simple, but not easy. It's just a lot of grit and grind. And if you could just get out there and stop thinking and just do it, you'll be busier than you can imagine. You'll have more business than you can handle, which is what happened to me, which is why I started a team. Love it. Well, let's make sure we save the last 10 minutes, Nicole. I'm going to do some more open house stuff. And then the last two minutes, you had, you know, we were prepping for this. You're saying, hey, I'm not doing as many open houses right now because, and I want to, I want to make sure we talk about that. So, so Stephen Hopkins, we've answered your question about what technology she's using. Uh, Kelly Zitlow, I think we've answered your question. Um, ben Anderson. Ben Anderson asked a question around how are you getting people to come to your open houses. And I know you've answered this in more detail. So I'll put it again, link down below for like a whole interview dedicated to this. But if you could just kind of ripped off what you consider to be some of the, the most important things to make sure people show up for the open house. Yeah, so it depends on where your open house is. Directionals are huge. You know, sometimes I would put out 15 different signs. Um, you know, especially if you have a house where you can get to it, where our market is, we're on an 80 corridor. So you can get to it usually between multiple exits. I mean, I'd pay somebody 20 bucks to put out 15 signs for me. Um, I started paying people after I almost died a couple times. <laughs> um, and that's huge. I mean, if people just see the sign, they usually follow it. I, I know I do too. If I see a sign and I see somebody's name on it, then I'm like, hey, I haven't talked to that realtor in a while. I'm going to go see what's up. I, I'm I'm inclined to follow the directionals as well. Um, if you're in a remoter, rem more remote area, more spread out area, target marketing. So doing Facebook ads is huge. Uh, you know, making sure that you're targeting the people who are looking in that area and putting that open house in front of them and um, blasting your database. Once you have a robust database, so my database is about 400 quality people. I just say, hey, friends, I'm doing it, especially now that I'm not doing them as often because you don't want them getting bombarded. But hey, friends, I'm doing an open house this weekend. If you know anyone looking for a home in your community, and I'll target them because I've got them tagged with this school district or that school district. If anyone in your community, send them my way. Maybe this isn't the house for them, but you know how, how I work. So I would love to have your referral. So those are probably the top three ways that we drive traffic. So it would be directionals, advertising, and your database. And just going from past interviews, door knocking, you know, 10 mm, doors huge. in each direction. So huge, huge, huge. Especially for you, whether you're a new realtor or a new loan officer, Imagine if you did, you know, three plus open houses a week. Imagine if you door knocked, you know, 10 doors on each direction and across the street. Think about how good you would get, you know, think about how good you'd get at having the conversation. And by the way, 
regardless of how much business you do, think about how good you'll feel about yourself. Like I'm getting after it. So, so listen to those other interviews and especially if you're new in the business or let's say you're not hitting your goals, get after it. Do three plus open houses, door knock in every direction and uh, make it happen. All right. So Ben also had a question and this came in from a few other folks around how do you feel about the Zillow instant offers, Redfin, homebuyer.com, you know, just let's call it the disruptors, you know, yeah. um, how, how concerned are you about it? And what narrative do you have uh, that might be helpful for other agents and other loan officers? Yeah, no, I, I actually think it's great. I think that there's enough room and enough business and enough type of buyers and sellers to go around. Um, I think that being a buyer's agent is going to be more prevalent because these instant offers or, or the Redfin, you know, 1% fee, uh, home buyer will buy for 90% of fair market value. Those are targeted towards sellers, right? So if you have a database full of buyers, they're still paying a commission. That whole $20 a door to show a house, that concept will never work. There's realtors out there that know that they can provide way more value than just opening a door or consumers, you know, the new consumer lockbox method. Sellers aren't going to go for that traditional sellers. You know, I have people, sellers that won't even let me put a realtor lockbox on their house, let alone letting consumers come straight into their house. So I think it's good. There's a niche market for it, but I don't think it's going to replace us. I think that it might weed out some of the people who maybe this business wasn't cut out for in the first place, but people like me and people on the call and their realtor partners, I think that we're going to be here to stay. And we're actually, their consumers are going to see our value more than ever, thanks to these new products and these new companies. Yeah, and I, I agree. Well, and by the way, your value. I mean, you are delivering this great experience. You know, the Jeremy's, the top producers that are really delivering value, not, you know, loan officers, taking apps, quoting rates, keeping promises. There's a lot of lenders that could do that. Delivering a total cost analysis, being an advisor, actually helping a family get their offer accepted. You know, listen to that interview I did with Tim Burheen. Uh, link down below his perfect loan process and how not only is the buyer getting a total cost analysis, but now he's creating a video that's a story about that buyer that makes the seller go, wow, this offer really stands out. Um, mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I'm going to skip to other questions. Josh Metal had asked a question around what are you doing to help, you know, when you're on the buy side, get offers to stand out so that your, your buyers have the best possible opportunity to get accepted? What are some of the tactics, strategies that you're doing and that you're pushing your lender partners to do? Okay, I'm gonna throw some really, really solid nuggets out here. So the first one, I do a lot of VA. We're here at Travis Air Force Base. Um, so VA scares a lot of sellers, which it shouldn't because I love VA. I love, I love that, I love the appraisal process. I love that it's cut and dry. I love that, you know, there, you could do Tidewater, like, I wish we could do Tidewater on all types of loans. That would be amazing. Um, so what I do is I put together um, not only a resume for my buyer, but a resume for my lender, a resume for myself. And it's not a long drawn out thing. And this is in addition to the buyer's letter, especially if it's owner occupied, family to family, VA to VA, for sure. You can look up in tax records if there's a currently a VA loan or what type of loan there is on it. This works for FHA too. Um, you know, if you could tug on their heartstrings a little bit to remember um, an FHA home buyer being their first their their first home buying experience and write for a first time home buyer a letter that really talks to that seller. So targeting the seller, looking up the seller, I'll even Facebook stalk the seller, say, hey, look, look, this is their personality. We should redo the letter to talk about this. They have kids too. Let's really talk about your kids. They have pets. Let's put a dog resume in there. We've done dog resumes. Um, so letting them know who the buyer is, not just on, we call it the residential purchase agreement, the California RPA. You can't tell a story with the RPA. You can tell a story of who the buyer is with those resumes and those letters and uh, pictures, and then also who I am and how I work and how, what their expectations should be for me that I close on time, you know, that I haven't, I've had, you know, 98% um, acceptance rate and, you know, 100% close rate this year, you know, uh, my lender, who he is and how he works and how he can underwrite people ahead of time so that they can close in 17 days instead of 30 days that we have no no loan contingency going in we only have an appraisal contingency um, all of those things are going to make our offer stand out and we tidy it together in a nice neat package and we send it over as one pdf so that the realtor on the other side can just print it because 
Believe it or not, guys, realtors are lazy. So if you can make the other agent's job easier, <laughs> they're going to love you even more. Um, also on VA, what I do is I offer to credit up to $1,000 in any VA required pest work that could come up. Um, obviously, I've seen the house because I'm showing these houses. So I know if I you know, go show the house and like the roof is falling off and there's eaves hanging down, I'm not going to do that. But um, I will offer a, a $1,000 credit and I tell my buyers too, hey, if your pest inspection comes back clean, you can use that credit towards uh, your funding fee, closing costs extra home warranty, whatever you want. It's the thousand dollars is yours, but let's let's write it in here as a pest credit. Love, love it. So guys, tons of value. And it's just it's just clear she's giving this um, extreme personalized service. She's, you know, she knows her customers. She's telling a story about her lender, about herself, so that when that offer comes in, it just stands out. Anything else you want to add to that before we move on to another question? Always call the, as a listing agent because I'm heavy listing now. Um, as a listing agent, always call the listing agent and have your lender call the listing agent and let them know. Um, they, a pre approval letter is nice, but when they hear from the lender, hey, this is Jeremy Forsey, uh, I'm, I'm local, I work out of your market, you know, I'm two miles away, I know the escrow officer that we wrote in here, I know the escrow officer that you pre opened it with, I've actually even heard of you, you're fantastic. Like that personal touch makes them makes you stand out, especially in a multiple offer situation. Love it. So another question from, from Ben, and by the way, folks that are asking us to repeat answers, you know, this will be in our YouTube channel. This is being recorded. You'll, you could go and listen to that because we just got so many questions. I want to keep it rolling and I want to get the most out of Nicole here. But here's how he asked the question. And we, we kind of already touched it, but I'd really love for you to net this out for other agents. So what are the key ingredients it will take for a realtor to survive in the price compression market we're heading into? So, you know, given all the disruptions happening in this space, if you could just kind of give your rant on for a realtor to crush it in 20 and 20 and beyond, what should they be doing? Well, working hard, grit and grind. I mean, nothing, nothing's going to beat working hard. You got to work hard. You got to work smart. So all those little nuggets of information that I gave you, you know, you can work hard all day long and you can say, oh, I, you know, worked 60 hour weeks, but I'm not writing contracts because you got to write, you got to work smart too. So working hard and smart and building your team up around you. Like when you have a team so that when you're working so, so, so hard to get that business, that that business doesn't go away for you. For example, you know, escrows falling apart or, you know, you're getting so busy that you're not able to do the open houses or do the prospect or do your sphere of influence calls because you're too busy putting out fires or servicing. You have to have that team in place. And that team is good escrow, good lender, good, um, good assistance, good transaction coordinators, building that all up around you so that you can provide that high level personal service. You know, uh, I remember I had uh, two years ago, I was two years into the business, two years, I had 54 escrows going at once and it was just me. I was even trying to do my own files. And I literally wow. thought, I literally thought I was like, I'm going to die. This is it. This is how I'm going to go out. I'm going to have a heart attack or a stroke or something. Um, and I was just trying to do it all. And I remember my client coming to me saying, hey, Nicole, thanks for helping me so far, but you're obviously too busy for me. And it broke my heart because I never wanted anybody to feel like I was too busy for them. So going into this, this new market, you know, 2022, with all these disruptors and um, all these new things and, you know, consumers being as confused as ever about our role in, in their home buying process and home selling process. I think that that continued high level of personal touch and making sure that you know, uh, know your market, know the industry, continuing education so that you can talk at these high levels. Like there's, there's one thing that's constant and it's change, especially in our industry. So if you're up as a realtor, I keep up with new escrow laws, new Senate bills. I keep up with all the new lending requirements as well as all the real estate information. So when you can talk about that stuff and provide that information, you know, like that, instead of saying, uh, I don't know, or, Ooh, that doesn't make sense. They're going to realize that you're more powerful and you're more important than, you know, one, two, three.com, the newest, hottest way to buy or sell a house. So tell me if you agree with this. I think, and I, I actually did a post today on LinkedIn. It talked about the, the most important thing is creating digital friends. The loan officer, lender, realtor with the most digital friends wins today, 2020 and beyond. And to me, a digital friend, and, and, and I'm gonna tie this to how you do open houses, 
is someone that you have not just their email address, you've got their mobile, their email, you know how they want to communicate, Facebook Messenger. Um, they downloaded your app. So if you're on this call and you're a loan officer, they downloaded the total cost analysis app. If you have a point of sale app that makes it easy for them to apply online, take pictures, they've downloaded your point of sale app. Um, how, what are your thoughts? Is it just essential that you're building those digital friends and then you're communicating in smart digital ways? Thoughts totally. on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's people who I work with that will only come in with their stack of, you know, W-2s and tax return or W-2s tax returns. They're everything and they want me to scan it all in for them. But then there's people who are like, no, I just want to send it to you. So you actually have to be able to be, you know, agile and go both ways. But I would say a majority of the people, um, you know, with Jeremy, he's not even meeting people anymore. You know, he is able to service them at a really high level be on a video call with them, make them feel like they personally know him because he's sending out um, every time that there's a there's a, a an update, he's sending out a bomb bomb. He doesn't use bomb bomb, but whatever it is, um, and letting them know. So that's so important. It's super important, especially as you start getting busier, which is like where I am. You know, I'm the face of the brand, and they want to work with Nicole Solari, the Solari Group. But I actually have showing agents now, so they want to feel like they're working with me without with when I actually haven't even met some of the clients that I've closed escrow with. But they feel it, you know, when we get the reviews on Zillow.com or Yelp.com, they're like, Nicole is amazing. When in reality, you know, the digital touch is where it all was. Yeah, no, no doubt. And to add another footnote, they are adding video, and and there's a lot of ways of doing video. I mean, Jeremy gives every family the total cost analysis. He adds a video to that. But by the way, he does other videos. You know, he's, he'll text videos. He'll, if I recall, one of the things that you loved about Jeremy in a previous interview that we did is that after the meeting, he sent you a video. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. he, he followed up. He delivered a total cost analysis and showed how he created, he, he, he made it clear to you that he could distinguish himself not only by his work ethic, but he could help families go from confusion to clarity faster and more consistently than his peers. Is that not what really got him to your, you know, becoming one of your premium par um, partners? Totally. Well, the other thing I love about Jeremy, and I haven't been able to do this yet, but man, it'll be 5.30 a.m. and he'll be soaking wet. Cause if you know Jeremy Forsey, he's a sweater. I mean, I sweat a lot, but this man, <laughs> right? He'll be, right? He'll be coming from the gym, soaking wet, you know, a mess. And he'll be like, hey, what's up, Joe? This is this is Jeremy. I just wanted to give you a quick update on your loan I saw this morning. Hey, blah, blah, blah. And it shows people that he's so real. Like he's a real person. He's there to help. He cares. He's checking his email at 5 a.m. because he time blocks. He does check his email and then he does the video follow-ups. And I'm CC'd on those and I'm just going, J-Dog, you look like a hot mess. But it, people love it. They absolutely love it. So it's that digital touch that's so personal. Yeah, and that, and that authenticity, which by the way, that reminds me, I just interviewed Jeremy last week. And so listen to that interview below. That interview was in today's market, price compression, rate shopping. It was, hey, how is Jeremy dealing with that challenge? That borrower that calls up and says, hey, you're great. I really like you, but I found a rate that's a quarter percent less or an eighth of a percent less. It was, how does Jeremy show up? You know, what's the scripting? What's the strategy? And by the way, part of it is just, what's his heart? You know, his heart is, hey, no problem. I know you got to do right by your family. Let me help you, you know? Anyways, listen to that interview down below. So Nicole, let's go to some ad hoc questions that have come in. Uh, by the way, Mortgage Coach community, great job for lighting it up out there. Uh, I think I have more questions officially now that I can answer. But um, people want to know uh, how often are real loan officers partnering with you at open houses, you know? Uh, and if, if the loan officer is helping you at an open house, what are they doing to help? Um, well, I would say 100% of the time, because even if they're not there, they're doing something to add value, um, whether it's providing the flyers with the rate sheets, whether it's providing the total cost analysis for different scenarios, um, whether it's actually showing up, or if I'm, you know, it's a, I call them my mega open houses for brand new listings. If they're going to actually show up and we do like a catering. It's providing the catering. Even for example, Jeremy has his um, marketing person, Jeb, drop off the food ahead of time. So a hundred percent of the time in one way or another, it just depends on how high level and how busy we anticipate the open house being, you know, I don't want, 
it's not necessary for my lender to be with me when it's a slower weekend, a holiday weekend, open house, and I've got it handled. I've got my TCA. I've got my uh, rate sheet flyers. I, I just don't need them. It doesn't add value to him for him to be there. Um, but when he can provide value by being there, when we know it's going to be a slammed open house, you know, there are hundred, he's a hundred percent there. Love it. By the way, when Nicole said TCA, that's total cost analysis. And again, Nicole is all about paperless open houses. She's got her app. She knows how to create a digital friend, start a digital friendship by saying, Hey, and you heard the script earlier, put your name and information in here. And boom, at least she's got the beginning of that digital friend. And she knows how to use a total cost analysis. When, if that conversation is appropriate, when it's appropriate. So make sure you make note of that. What about loan officers? You know, let's, let's go into, we got about five more minutes and I just want to focus on how you're maximizing your database. But, but let's just do one question for loan officers out there that are either going to open houses to win agents or they're calling on agents. What are some do's and don'ts? Like, don't do this, you know, guys and gals, but do this. Any thoughts for loan officers that are trying to start that conversation? Mm -hmm. So uh, when going to open houses, do bring food. That's awesome. Candy, anything, beverages. Um, always bring food. Uh, I remember there was this loan officer that would always bring like Hershey's chocolates around. And I know it sounds so simple and easy, but when you've been sitting over three hours and two people have come in and you're literally like walking around taking videos of yourself, wondering which ones to post. That person walking in with the Hershey's is like a savior. So if nothing else, you've like made a really good first impression. Um, and then, um, you know, when you get there, don't, again, what I do with consumers that walk in, don't make them feel pressure. Don't make them feel like you're there just to win their business over, you know, Hey, I saw your name. I know you're a top producer. I'm here to try to work with you. I like that upfront approach, but don't make it seem awkward. Um, which actually nothing, no one can ever be awkward with me. You can ask Jeremy about that. I'm probably the most awkward person you'll ever meet when it comes to those things. Um, and don't, uh, don't badger with questions. You know, like I always, so they say, Hey, how are you so busy? How are you getting all of this business? I'm like, duh, I'm here right now. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, that's like a, like a, you just answered your own question. Like I'm here on a Sunday instead of with my family. What, you know, how do you, how do you, how are you so busy? Um, and, and then, you know, if you listen to Jeremy's, uh, five questions, that was huge for me. You know, I started out in the business and no one would give me the time of day, escrow officers, lenders, et cetera. Jeremy said a meeting with me and he was the only one that actually took the time to actually care and, about my business. Like, Hey, how can I actually help you? How can I help you grow? Where are the struggles in your business? Where are you seeing the most success in your business? Um, he actually actually introduced me to a coaching program as well that I that I love that's taken my business to the next level and really helped me save more money by um, and make more money inevitably by doing less. But he really really did care. So it keeps going back to the same concept of just keeping it personal and making people feel like you actually care about them, not just their business. Love that, and I hope everybody heard it. Whether you're a new realtor or you're experienced um, loan officers. Jeremy started working with Nicole before she was Nicole Solari, 200 homes a year, and he, he just cared. He showed up, um, and I, I think, you know, again, you got to be thoughtful. You know, loan officers out there, you can't help every new loan officer. You know, you need to be very specific around, hey, how many, you know, mega producers am I going after? How many mid-tier? And then but always invest in new people coming up in the business that are good essence matched with you. And they're keeping promises with each other. I'm sure Jeremy figured it out pretty quickly that helping you was a great investment. And it was also a lot of fun. You guys just connected. So, so let's do this. Let's transition. For anybody's questions I haven't got to around open houses, apologies. But Nicole, you've, you've built this great database. I know you're not doing as many day-to-day -day open houses right now. If you could just speak to that, because I think that's also kind of like, it's so exciting for people that, hey, you could grind, do open houses, build this database, and then what? Tell us about what you're doing now. Yeah, so the business comes back to you. I'm four years in, and about 80% of my business is referral-based now. Um, the other, well, I say at 80%, it's probably more like 90 because I have a lot of realtor referrals too. Um, and then the other 10% is that organic that comes from my listings, again, that I'm doing open houses on. Um, I've stopped internet leads, which is amazing. I've saved 
you know, thousands and thousands of dollars a month on internet leads. And I'm able to spend weekends with my families. Now I'm able to be home and cook dinner, you know, get off at five, cook dinner, uh, go to bed at a decent hour, wake up, go to the gym, come into the office at a decent hour. Like I, I probably work 35 hours a week just on my real estate business. I have other businesses that take up some time, but um, what happens is when you do the grind in the first few years and you set up your, your systems and you set up your database, the business, your phone starts ringing. Like literally my phone rings, Hey, Nicole, can you come list my house? You sold it to me for two years ago. We're ready to move up. We're having another baby. We need a four bedroom. We want to get into a good school district. And, um, it, it's, it's amazing. If you set it up right and you provide that personal high quality service, you know, they're going to come back to you. They're actually going to call you and they're going to refer your friends. Um, I forget the narcissist statistic. Somebody out there probably knows it, but I think it's, uh, 87, 80 something percent of consumers cannot remember the name of their real estate agent two years later, which is crazy to me because my entire database is people that I know, like trust, want to work with again, but don't worry. There's some people in there that there's, there's a lot of people I worked with that are not in my database. Keep that in mind. Once you get busy enough, you can be choosy. Um, but your phone starts ringing and it's people like, Hey, Nicole, how's it going? My sister's moving here. I know that you don't service San Francisco. Um, but you do such a good job. I'm sure you can refer us to someone. Boom, instant referral fee. So just be in front of your database all the time and, and set up grind. It took me probably two years of grind to be two years of like work-life balance. And it's amazing once that happens. You'll see the shift. Actually, you'll feel the shift. All of a sudden, I was like, whew, I don't feel so busy, but I'm busier than ever. And it's such an amazing feeling. Well, and make note, everybody. By the way, that, those first couple of years, how many hours were you putting in? How many open houses? Just give us a player, player for that. There was 60, 70, sometimes 80 hour weeks. Um, I mean, it wasn't all the time. It wasn't constant, but you know, summer, summer out, summer days, especially when I had that 54 escrows and I was so stubborn. I'm like, yeah, I can do my own files too. I got this. Nobody's going to do it better than me. Um, there was definitely 80 hour work week. Sometimes there was, um, you know, days that I would leave the house before the kids were awake and not get home until they were asleep. And I wouldn't eat, um, which I don't recommend. I'm not saying grind like me. This is why I'm doing these, these interviews so that I can tell people like, get your systems in place, get your structure in place. Um, cause when I started in the industry, I didn't have something like this. I didn't have Dave doing these mortgage coach interviews where realtors were sharing all their, their secrets. In fact, I had people telling me, no, I'm not going to share my secrets. Why would I share your secrets? My secrets just so you can steal them. Um, that's not my mindset. And I want to share with everyone out there so they don't have to do the 80 hour work weeks. Maybe you just have to do the 50, 55 hour work weeks for two years. So take the systems and implement them before you get too busy. And, and I want everybody to think of this metaphor because Nicole did the grind because when the open house was over, instead of go have a burrito or a drink, she sent a personalized follow-up because she worked with a loan officer like Jeremy Forcier and all of her families get a total cost analysis because there's all of this quality up front in the experience. Now on the back end, it's just working the database and now it's time for life balance. By the way, it's the mortgage coach community. And one of the reasons why I do these interviews is one to get more loan officers using mortgage coach total cost analysis. And then two, there's a lot of loan officers that have it and they just don't do it for everybody. They wait until they're getting a rate shot to use total cost. Could you, as a realtor who has a loan officer like Jeremy that gives everybody a TCA, total cost analysis, could you just speak to the community about what you like about a total cost analysis and why loan officers should, you know, deliver it consistently? Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you what, Jeremy rarely gets rate shopped. Um, in fact, he gives rates through the TCA and people are so enamored with the sleekness of it, the easy to read, how he delivers it, the video follow-up that's at the bottom of the TCA. Um, they don't go and shop rates because they realize that Jeremy just put together so many scenarios. He worked really hard, which by the way, it's not that hard to just plug and play. Um, he worked really hard to find the right solution for them. They're not going to go shop it with their local bank or, you know, the, uh, the lender in, you know, middle America that, you know, works that works out of a call center and doesn't actually do anything um, th that their sister used and had a horrible experience with, they're not doing that because they've already decided that Jeremy is their person. So I don't know why everybody wouldn't do a TCA for every person that they meet, like doing for your mom, doing for your sister, 
say, Hey, Hey mom, you've lived here for 20 years. You've got a hundred percent equity. Why don't we sell this, this and put you into a condo? Like I, it's like a party trick. You should use it as a party trick. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And then I think another thing that a lot of people don't get and a lot of agents don't get is that it creates this clarity around urgency. If it's a renter that's saying I should buy, it's like, Jer you're, you're, you're selling the emotion and the home and the lifestyle. And Jeremy is, the, Jeremy is making it clear what is the net worth and the benefit and the financials of owning versus renting. Or it's someone who's moving up. Should I buy now or should I wait a year? Jeremy's making that clear. Could you speak to the value of that clarity for you as an agent? Yeah, I mean, it's bottom line. It's the same thing that I said earlier in the interview. You know, your affordability factor is not the purchase price. It's what you're comfortable with each month. It's what you feel comfortable writing a check to a mortgage bro or a bank to every single month. You know, it's not, um, it's not that purchase price. And in, until you completely understand what your PITI is, you're not going to, I'm not going to go show you homes. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and waste your time for you to be shocked. In fact, you're actually probably going to be surprised. Um, another thing that I use the uh, TCA for is to actually refer Jeremy business. So he's inclined to refer me business back. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time and they're like, yeah, I've lived in my home for 20 years. I don't want to move. I love my home. And I say, well, that's interesting. You know, what's your mortgage payment? And they tell me, and I'm so shocked because, you know, 20 years ago, the interest rates were just totally bananas. So I show them a TCA and I said, let me get you hooked up with my lender to get you done, you know, streamline refi, um, super easy. It'll save you this much money per month. So then I can refer them to Jeremy. So then when Jeremy is out there getting pre-approved buyers, he's going to be more inclined to, you know, refer them to me because I gave him three refis last month. Love it. And, and by the way, another great strategy folks, before we wrap this up is move up, you know, like Nicole, mm -hmm. think of some buyers or some people in homes, where you just kind of know that, hey, they're within a year or two of moving up. Jeremy could do a move up analysis for them and create a listing and create a buyer. And so for all you agents watching this, you know, ask your loan officer, hey, I've got, you know, out of my hundreds of people that I've helped, here's two or three that I think are likely to move up. Could you help make it clear for them? And by the way, if they do the TCA and they're like, nah, well, you delivered a service. You help that family make an educated decision. Should I move up now or should I wait? But by the way, if you do enough of those, you're going to create some double-ended deals. You're going to create some, some, some listings and some sales. So Nicole, you are awesome. You, you are, you know, just an amazing person to interview. Uh, love your authenticity, love all your ideas and strategies. Uh, remember folks, if you got value from this, please like it, whether it's in Facebook or, or um, YouTube, like it and share it with your mortgage friends, share it with your realtors. Nicole, any last words before we wrap up today's call? Um, no, I'm gonna go grind. Go Have get it done. Day, <laughs> Take it easy, everybody. Great call, really loved it. See you, Nicole. Bye. Bye.